Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Arlington Committee of 100's virtual program, Let's Be Blunt, What's Next for Cannabis in Arlington? My name is Krista Jones. I'm a Committee of 100 board member and the program producer, along with the moderator for this evening. Before we get started, we have a few announcements. On May 8th, we'll be co-hosting with George Mason University for a candidate county board debate at DMU's Virginia Square Auditorium. There you go. And on June 12th, um, we'll have our last program of the year at the Museum of Modern Art in Arlington or MOCA. And stay tuned for more information because we're planning a big send off for the year. As always, a note about donations. We need your continued financial support to cover our operational and technical expenses. There are many behind the scenes expenses and putting our programs together, and we need donations to continue doing what we're doing. You can donate online using a credit card or by writing a check to the PO box also on our website. Even if you're already a donor, additional donations are needed too and always appreciated. No donation is too small. In terms of submitting a question tonight, you can submit your questions um, in the Q&A tab at any time. Um, please be sure to make sure your name is included. I know that anonymous is sometimes an option if you would want to be recognized. Uh, we will get to as many questions as we can tonight. Before introducing the panelists, I also wanna thank Committee of 100 board members, Liz Nora and Karen Bate for their behind the scenes support for this program. So first, I just want to give some background. Uh, marijuana, which can also be called cannabis, weed, or pot, refers to the dried flowers, leaves, stems, and seeds of the cannabis plant. The cannabis plant contains more than 100 compounds or cannabinoids. These compounds include THC, which is impairing and mind-altering, as well as other active comp compounds such as CBD. CBD is not impairing, meaning it does not cause a high. Marijuana is the most commonly used federally illegal drug in the United States, with an estimated 48.2 million people using it in 2019. Marijuana use may have a wide range of health effects on the body and the brain. While for decades, marijuana was often considered harmless, much more research needs to be done to determine its true effects. One study estimated that approximately three in 10 people who use marijuana have marijuana use disorder, meaning they are unable to stop using marijuana even though it's causing health and social problems in their lives. By increasing cannabis use, we also must consider a number of other aspects, such as criminalization or lack thereof, the impact on youth and the economic impacts and equity. Today's panel will explore what's happening in Virginia and Arlington in terms of the legislative, regulatory, and economic perspectives. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Each speaker will have about eight minutes to make opening remarks in the order that they're introduced. First, we have Senator Adam Eben, who fights for progressive priorities, including preventing gun violence, making it easier to vote, preserving reproductive freedom, and equality for all Virginians. Adam took office in 2012 after serving eight years in the House of Delegates. He was reelected in 2023 in the newly drawn, redrawn 39th Senate District to continue representing Alexandria and portions of Arlington and Fairfax counties. He's received Neighborhood Health, Health Equity Award, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws Vanguard Award, and he is the chair of the Cannabis Oversight Commission. We also have Senator Aaron Rouse, who was born in Norfolk, and raised by his mother and grandparents in Virginia Beach. He graduated from First Colonial High School and attended Virginia Tech on a football scholarship. Rouse was drafted by the Green Bay Packers in the 2007 NFL Draft and also played for the New York Giants and Arizona Cardinals. After retiring from the NFL, Aaron returned home to start a nonprofit organization focused on children in underserved communities and served on the Virginia Beach City Council. As state senator, Aaron is focused on building a strong economy for our community, lowering healthcare costs, and ensuring every student has a quality public education and access to job training. He serves as the chair of the Senate Privileges and Elections Committee, overseeing all matters dealing with voting and elections issues in Virginia. Next, we have Sean Casey, who serves as the Deputy Chief Regulatory Policy and External Affairs Officer for the Virginia Cannabis Control Authority. 
At the CCA, she leads a team tasked with developing regulations, analyzing legislative proposals, and preparing resources to support the CCA's public safety and public health initiatives. Before joining the CCA, Sean practiced law for a decade, most recently as a senior assistant attorney general in Colorado, where she advised the state's marijuana and liquor enforcement divisions for five years. Sean holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia and a law degree from the University of Arizona Rogers College of Law. And lastly, we have Brent Wolovec, who brings singular strategic planning and strong business acquisition and cannabis development experience to his role as Chief Strategy Director at Jushi. Brent formerly served as the president of PGS National Holdings, an affiliate of The Green Solution, as well as COO at American Cannabis Company, where he worked with his clients to win state cannabis licenses. Trent earned his BS in finance from Miami University. So I will turn it over to Senator Evan. Oops, you're on mute, Senator Evan. Sorry about that. Uh, good evening, and thanks for having me, Krista, and thanks to the Committee 100 for organizing uh, a discussion of uh, this important topic. Um, I, one thing I just want to emphasize, well, two things I want to emphasize. Uh, the CDC you mentioned in your introduction points out that cannabis is the most commonly used federally illegally illegal drug in the United States, which means that about 48.2 million Americans uh, or 18 percent of the country have used it once in in uh, at least in like say 2019 um adult possession and the other thing i want to point out is that adult possession of um, cannabis has been legal in virginia for almost three years now uh there's just no legal way to purchase it without uh, a uh, prescription from and an at a medical provider um and we have a large cannabis market in virginia Unfortunately, outside of the medical cannabis space in Virginia, the market is controlled by cartels and organized crime. In fact, according to uh, New Frontier data over the past few years, the illicit market has skyrocketed from an estimated $1.8 billion a year in 2021 to $2.4 billion a year in 2023. And instead of having that money reinvested in our communities, tens of millions of dollars in unrealized revenue is lining the pockets of organized crime. That's money that we're giving away to, to, to crime that could be benefiting our communities, including here in Arlington. Uh, funding could help educate the public about the dangers of impaired driving while using cannabis and equip law enforcement with the right training and equipment to com combat um, driving offenses like that. But it could also raise funds to remind Virginians to use adult substances responsibly if one chooses to use them and it could provide funds to our mental health system. And for these reasons and many more, it's uh, past time for Virginia to seize control of the illegal market, uh, the recreational cannabis market and tax and regulate it. Um, in 2020, I passed Senate Bill 2, which determined, or, or should say decriminalize the possession of cannabis. And also in 2020, the General Assembly directed Virginia's Legislative Watchdog Agency, JLARC, the Joint Legislative Audit and Review Commission, to review how the state could legalize cannabis with a focus on how the prior harm to disproportionately affected individuals and communities can be addressed. JLARC reached some important conclusions that continue to guide my thinking and that of many experts in the future of cannabis in Virginia. And among the most important JLARC conclusions about cannabis was its recommendation to provide ownership opportunities for social equity businesses by establishing a licensing uh, process and business assistance program for those businesses to uh, effectively compete with well-established uh, larger marijuana businesses. Uh, for anyone looking to get involved in cannabis policy in Virginia, the JLARC uh, report is an important document. And then the following year, in 2021, I passed Senate Bill 1406, setting in motion the process of full cannabis legalization in Virginia, which created our Cannabis Control Authority, which referred to as the CCA. Unfortunately, in 2021, uh, the election provided a serious setback for cannabis reform in Virginia. Namely, we had a Republican governor and a Republican House of Delegates. And that meant in 2022, the General Assembly was unable to complete the complicated work of establishing a, a marketplace because the uh, House blocked our efforts. 
Uh, fast forwarding to present day, this means Virginia still needs to establish a commercial marketplace for safe recreational cannabis products. Um, Virginia Republicans have not attempted to repeal uh, legal cannabis possession, so we do need to move, move forward with creating a legal marketplace for the purchase of the product. And um, last year, 2023, I continued that effort introducing a bill to create, again, a, a safe market for recreational cannabis that passed the Senate with the support of Democrats and Republicans. Uh, unfortunately, that bill, though, was not given a fair chance of success in the Republican-controlled House delegates. Um, but we did remove that obstacle with last year's elections, uh, electing a House and Senate Democratic majority. So we move forward again this year with another effort to create the recreational cannabis marketplace. Um, we had uh, two bills uh, to represent a, a path to a legalized and safe cannabis marketplace in Virginia that got combined and passed uh, in the form of Senator Rouse's bill. Um, my bill uh, also was prioritizing the creation of micro businesses and the licensing of entrepreneurs from over police communities as recommended by the JLARC report. And I was glad that critical parts of my bill were incorporated into the consensus legislation that Senator Rouse carried. Unfortunately, the, the governor vetoed that bill and it was unable um, to garner Republican votes in the um, House. Um, but it's uh, well past time for the governor and his Republican colleagues to take this seriously. We can't keep putting it off or succumbing to simple partisan politics. Every year without legal taxation and regulation means another year of um, hundreds of millions of dollars in profits for organized crime and, and not for state tax dollars. And without legal taxation or regulation, every year means another year without new funding that could help improve so many core state programs. Um, as I have for several years, I'll keep fighting for a regulated and safe recreational adult use uh, cannabis marketplace and will continue to welcome folks joining me legislatively. Um, and um, we cannot allow unregulated, untested products to proliferate through our communities, even getting used by kids, while the organized crime of the black market reaps hundreds of millions of dollars in annual profit. Let's put the state government to work so that these uh, products are safe, tested, and only available for purchase from viable and licensed and responsible retailers. Let's prevent cannabis retailers from selling to underage Virginians and ban them from selling, uh, distributing unsafe, untested products throughout the Commonwealth. And along the way, we can raise hundreds of millions in revenue uh, for public health and mental health that we can put to use in better education, educating our communities. Um, thank you very much. And I, I look forward to hearing from my fellow panelists and then uh, hearing uh, your questions and concerns. Thank you, Senator Eben. We'll turn it over to Senator Rao. Well, good evening. Thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, address you all. You say hi to my uh, Senate colleague there, Senator Edmund, and everyone on the panel. Um, good to see you all. Um, I won't. Um, I think Senator Edmund did a, a really fantastic job of really speaking to why um, you know, a, a, an adult use cannabis market, um, adult retail use cannabis market is why it's so needed today to really drive out the illicit market um, as well. And so um, one of the things I, I do want to highlight and, and make sure um, folks understand is, is that, you know, at the federal level, you have the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, um, along with senators, uh, request from the DEA that marijuana be rescheduled from a Schedule One uh, drug, which is the highest or most restrictive um, drug or category there is to a Schedule Three. And so um, as more and more comes, more and more information comes down and understanding cannabis and marijuana, I think we already see the federal level taking steps to uh, reschedule uh, uh, cannabis. And this is another reason, uh, a major reason why I supported and carried the bill SB 448. Um, it's because Virginia's, we ought to be a, a leader in this category, understanding that, you know, this bill, that was passed um, throughout the House and Senate, it did not legalize marijuana. What it attempts to do is, is regulate, tax, and enforce 
um, a, a market that where we're seeing that without this regulation in place, um, a lot of bad things are happening. And, you know, I've, speak, I've spoken to law enforcement throughout our Commonwealth who all said that there's this gray area um, so to speak, of what's legal and what's not legal when it comes to marijuana. But on the same time of that, you have this infusion of marijuana uh, coming from all sorts of places. And so making sure that there's a market to where you know, these products are tested, they're labeled, um, they're sold uh, in, in safe and in, uh, in licensed places, making sure that you know kids don't have access to readily, readily easily access to these um, types of products um, is needed. And we've seen that um, throughout our Commonwealth. And so, you know, to me, also coming from a community that was highly over-policed, but also had, you know, uh, close friends and people that I grew up with go to prison um, for selling marijuana. And then you have this market, um, potentially uh, this market coming uh, to take place. Uh, it's very, very important that we get the social equity piece right. And that as well. Um, and so that was a, a major issue and the piece that we were able to work through. Um, and, and lastly, but, but certainly not least, um, what I what I like to think of is, is this bill is really pretty much a compromise. And so um, like any form of legislation that comes out of the House and the Senate, you have to be able to work with um, those who support you and those who are in opposition to you um, to find the middle ground. And I'm, I'm happy that we were able to find middle ground on this bill. Um, but I was really taken back that um, that this governor and the Republicans, um, this administration, did not see fit to legalize this market uh, throughout through this bill. This was a very, very good bill. And, you know, oftentimes we, we see the, the crucial impacts of untested products untested you know, marijuana, cannabis you know, products that are out there right now that are laced with all kinds of dangerous uh, chemicals. And this was an opportunity to really drive that market away and put in um, a safer market. Now, I believe uh, there were a couple of comments made that, you know, anyone thinks that this, you know, setting up an adult uh, use market will drive away the illicit market I'll say, no, we're, we're, we're not saying that, you know, if, if that was the approach, you know, you wouldn't still have speakeasies uh, and bootleggers still around today if, if that was the case. Um, but what this does do is an attempt to make um, our communities a lot safer, make it so uh, the, the laws are a lot clearer for our law enforcement officers um, to go out and enforce the law, make sure there are safe products there, but also the economic side of this bringing economic dollars to are already um, uh, to our localities who are looking for resources, bring it for uh, bringing revenues and resources so we can get at the heart of our transportation issues so we can start funding K-12 education where it should be. And so, again, we had a, a real opportunity here to start chipping away at some of our major uh, issues that we have throughout our Commonwealth. Um, and it's unfortunate that um, this governor has um, decided to veto this bill, but the fight must go on, and, the, and I'm looking forward to continuing that effort. Thank you very much, Senator Rouse. Just a reminder to everyone to please put their questions in the Q&A section. We'll get to those when the presenters are done. I'm now going to turn it over to Sean Casey. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Um, I have some slides, so I'm going to do the ever fun attempt to share my screen. Um, people, no, nope, that's not what I wanted, but. Um, okay, that should work. Is that one working? Or is it still my settings? It worked. Mm -hmm. You can see my slides? Yes. Okay, great, awesome. Um, so I have slides, but I will I'll breeze through some of them to make sure that we're moving along. Um, so just first, a little bit about the CCA. Um, this is our mission statement. I won't read the whole thing, but some some points to point out are that we are an independent apolitical subdivision, and so we really exist to bring kind of that neutral perspective and uh, to promote public safety and public health through our regulatory and educative efforts. Um, 
So as part of that, we have three main roles. First, we're a regulator. Um, effective January 1 of this year, we started regulating the medical cannabis program. We're also a policy advisor and an educator. We don't make laws, but we help provide technical assistance to people who are creating laws, and we help educate people about what the laws are. Uh, so I'll talk about you know, our first role as regulator of the medical cannabis program. I think uh, some people are familiar with it, but some people have some uh, misinformation about it. So some of the basics, the state is divided into five regions that are called health service areas. There is one um, vertically integrated processor that grows, um, makes products and sells on site. And each of those uh, each of those processors in that one health service area can operate an additional five dispensing facilities. So the law currently allows for basically 30 dispensing locations for medical cannabis across Virginia. Right now, there are 22 in operation. Um, one of the reasons there's that gap between what the law allows and what's there right now is that there's no pharmaceutical processor currently in health service area one. That's that blue area that includes Charlottesville, Harrisonburg, Winchester. There's an application process currently ongoing for a pharmaceutical processor to operate in that area. Applications close um, of, on April 30th. And one thing just to keep it more relevant to the Northern Virginia audience, um, there are no more slots for dispensing facilities to operate under current law within Northern Virginia. There's currently one uh, cannabis dispensing facility in Arlington. And whether you want more or not, there will not be any more in Arlington under existing law. Um, also, just because I know there's some misconceptions about what are illicit operators and what are illicit operators. If you go to a place to buy cannabis in Northern Virginia, and it does not say beyond hello on the outside, that is not a regulated cannabis business in North, Northern Virginia. There are other companies that operate in other parts of Virginia, but if you or someone you know is going to a store with a different name on it, that is not a regulated tested product that you're buying under the medical cannabis program. Um, one thing you'll hear me talk about a little bit more going forward is that we're really focused on collecting and using data here at the CCA. Um, we don't have excellent historical data since we just took over the program, but this is some data to give us a sense of how many patients are using the medical cannabis program in Virginia. So on average, around 45,000 unique patients are accessing medical cannabis program in a given month. Um, and these dispensation numbers, they're quite high. That's for every single item that they're purchasing at that time. So if they go in and buy four things, each of those is a unique dispensation. I think sometimes those disparity in numbers um, give people a little bit of heartburn. Um, but if these numbers somewhat reflect the numbers of patients across Virginia, it's about 0.5% of the population that's using the medical cannabis program. That's significantly smaller than a lot of other medical cannabis states where it ranges more in the two to three percent range or, and maybe even on up. So we're not medical cannabis patients in Virginia are not fully utilizing the program that they have available to them. Um, switching more to things related to our educator and policy advisor role, um, you know, mentioned earlier were some of the studies from the CDC, uh, cannabis use disorder, but these are some of the potential effects. You know, it can impact brain development, mood. Um, there's also, depending on the method of consumption, maybe lung and heart impacts. And for products that um, are edible, you also have the same concerns about foodborne illness that you would, you would have in any other ed edible product. Um, and so there's also populations at greater risk. Uh, these shouldn't be too surprising youth older adults and those who are pregnant or breastfeeding for various reasons as listed on this side on this slide. So people should know their personal risks and talk to their doctor before considering medical cannabis. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, data is something we're really focused on. And so this is uh, this section of the slides is really more to give you some of the data that we're currently collecting. You know, uh, data right now is something that's still emerging in the cannabis world. And so not all of it is as complete 
as we would like, but we can give what we, we've collected so far. So these are some numbers about youth cannabis use in Virginia. This is from the 2021 Virginia Youth Survey conducted by BDH. Um, and so these show that in 2021, for example, 4% of high schoolers had tried marijuana for the first time before 13, uh, and 13% of high schoolers uh, who currently used um, used more one or more times during the 30 days before the survey. And then middle schoolers were slightly lower numbers. And if you find these numbers concerning, they're actually um, slightly lower than where they were in 2019. So it's on a downward trajectory in Virginia. They've completed the 2023 survey, but we don't have those numbers available to share quite yet. Um, the other concern that's come up a lot is uh, THC exposure calls to poison centers. A lot of this isn't really related to the regulated market, but either the illicit market or the gray market or um, hemp divided products that are being sold in some stores that uh, aren't regulated. And so you can see that there's a big uptick from 2020, 2020 to 2022. Northern Virginia has actually seen a drop in 2023. So it seems like things are going a little bit better um, in terms of reducing exposure to THC um, in Northern Virginia. One of the things that we were tasked with, um, switching gears a little bit, one of the things we were tasked with with the 2021 legislation that was uh, mentioned earlier by Senator Evan was uh, conducting a safe driving campaign. And the first step of that was to do an initial survey back in the summer of 2022. Um, and some of the results of that were pretty concerning, particularly this first one in the top left that 30% of Virginians think marijuana makes them a safer driver. Um, and so, you know, we've used that data to build a campaign um, around, you know, educating people. Um, this is some more about, you know, amount of marijuana use in the different regions. Um, notably, kind of on a per population basis, Northern Virginia has a lower percentage of use compared to populations than some other parts of the state. Um, and then more about the campaign itself. So we started with our first phase doing digital and online campaigns, um, also including Spanish language versions of those campaigns. Phase two, we moved to billboards. That's that first picture, a little buzz can cost a lot. So if anyone saw those, that, that was part of this campaign. And then we moved into TV, radio, um, and streaming. Uh, we also have a partnership toolkit. So agencies or other stakeholder groups that wanna help share information about the importance of you know, driving sober and not driving high can get materials from us to use. Um, and this is just information about how to connect with us, but we can go over all that later. So um, that's pretty much all I had. I wanted to make sure everyone has time for questions later. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, we'll now turn it over to Trent. Thanks, Krista. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to join uh, this, this evening. Um, I'll take a quick second to uh, acknowledge uh, Senator Rouse and Senator Eben um, on all their uh, phenomenal work um, they've done this past session uh, in, in getting a great compromise bill uh, up and out of the legislator and into the governor's desk. Uh, Senator Eben has done this for, for multiple years uh, and has been uh, a thought leader on this uh, in Virginia. Uh, also, Delegate Krizak, he's not on the line, but uh, he, he was a great patron uh, and, and a great uh, thought leader uh, in, in the House this year. And and Rouse, uh, Senator Rouse, Senator Evan, and, and, and Delegate Krizak all, all work together with many different stakeholders across the Commonwealth uh, to, to bring a very con comprehensive um, regulated uh, cannabis uh, marketplace to uh, to the Commonwealth and to the governor. Uh, Senator Evan, Senator Rouse, we're not done yet. We got the overturn session coming uh, next week, but, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But, uh, but um, um, you know, I think for us, now that we have a, a baseline um, and, and kind of a, um, you know, a, a place to go off of and, and going and starting to, to you know, talk to uh, to the Republicans um, in the legislature, 
uh, over the summer and into next session. Um, hopefully we can put a little bit more uh, pressure on the governor uh, to bring this to fruition uh, and get a fully regulated uh, cannabis market uh, because, you know, Senator Eben, you know, called it, called a lot of it out. Um, same with Senator Rouse uh, around where the gaps are. Um, and so the the last one I'll call out is is uh, is Sean. Um, her and I have gone way back, uh, even into the Colorado early cannabis days. Um, I think somebody asked about a state that's collected too many taxes or what they over um, estimated. I had to vote, I think, three, four or five years ago uh, in Colorado because they over collected tax. They were trying to give us back twenty three dollars. We voted. Uh, to let the keep the state keep that that excess tax, um, so uh, Colorado is a great example of of how a successful adult use program uh, has been rolled out uh, and been in operation for ten plus years now. Um, but a little bit about uh, myself, uh, I'm the chief strategy director for uh, Juicy Holdings. Uh, that's the parent company uh, that owns uh, the license uh, under Delitzo. Uh, in Northern Virginia, we're one of the four operational pharmaceutical processors in the state. Uh, we are HSA2, so you've probably seen our stores uh, across Northern Virginia. We now have six operational um, in our HSA. Uh, the closest one, or the one in Arlington, I should say, is uh, 2701 uh, Wilson Boulevard, right across the street from the Whole Foods. It's a big blue building. You can't miss it. Um, and then we also have uh, four other satellite uh, retail only stores, uh, one in Sterling, one in Fairfax, one in Alexandria, and one in Woodbridge. And then we have our uh, grower processor and one retail store um, out in Manassas. Uh, there in Manassas, we have um, cultivation, manufacturing um, that we do there as well in a 93,000 square foot building. Um, there we do everything from mothers to clones to veg to flour to harvest uh, to process to extract um, and then turn that into finished product. I think the most important thing um, that you know goes on in that facility is every single thing is uh, trace and tracked. So that way uh, we know from when we take a clone off the mother all the way to the finished product that goes into dispensaries um, after, by the way, it's been tested by an independent third-party lab. So we know exactly what's in that product, how many cannabinoids, how many terpenes, um, what the amount is. Um, all that is trace and tracked um, down to the gram. Uh, and so therefore there's no product diversion. Uh, also, if there's ever any issue, um, once a patient uh, gets that product, uh, we're able to trace it back either do a recall uh, and or understand just a little bit more uh, about the product and come up with a solve. And so I think, you know, we've talked about uh, and have laid out um, the illicit market uh, that has proliferated throughout uh, Virginia uh, since the decriminalization happened uh, in, in July of 21. Um, we are, are able to, to, to kind of counteract and bring um, real product to bear. Uh, we do everything. So any product that um, a, a patient may need uh, for their qualifying condition, um, we can make. So flour, concentrates, vapes, uh, infused products, uh, so on and so forth, um, are what we're able to produce um, out of that facility, uh, as well as we um, you know, bring in products to our stores uh, from the other operators um, throughout the state, uh, throughout the Commonwealth, excuse me, um, and so um, that's what we have uh, in, in our stores. Uh, we have a pharmacist uh, in every location um, so that, you know, if a patient wants to understand a little bit more about how, you know, medical, medical cannabis can be used, you know, for what they're trying to achieve, um, that option is, is in every single store um, so that they can, they can truly understand um, the, the benefits and the power of the plant um, that um, has been, you know, continuing to progress, you know, over the last, you know, eight plus years, um, you know, regulated wise uh, in, 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 in the Commonwealth, uh, or excuse me, six plus years about um, since we started. And so, um, 
you know, it's it's really exciting. Uh, the other thing I I I you know want to talk about a little bit is is um, you know, when somebody walks into our store, um, it's it's not like it's it's you know, a Johnny on the corner or you know, hey, I pick up my phone, I have internet internet access, I go to leafedout.com, I have my dealer on Instagram or Snapchat, um. You know, you walk in, you get you get carded. You walk onto the sales floor, you get carded again. Right before you cart, right before you check out, you get carded a third time. And so, um, I can assure you, there are no underage people that are buying uh, regulated cannabis uh, in Virginia um, through through one of our stores or through any of the other stores. Quite frankly, um, and so um, you know, this nomenclature that um, you know, it, 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 it impacts or it's going to proliferate usage, uh, for, you know, youth or teens or young adults, uh, that's just not true. Um, you know, there, there were other points, uh, within the veto. I won't get into those now. Um, but you know, what I'd tell you is, is make sure you do your research and understanding, um, as Senator Rouse, uh, pointed out, um, the HHS FDA has made the recommendation um, to reschedule this uh, from a Schedule One narcotic uh, to a Schedule Three narcotic. Uh, Schedule Three narcotic says there are medical benefits to it, uh, and it's not addictive. Uh, just for people's edification, like antibiotic steroids, uh, anything you get injected to to help with pain um, or displeasure is a, is a Schedule Three narcotic, and so um, you know there there's a responsible way to 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 do and handle that. Um, there's also a 50, 250 page uh, double ver verified um, step as to how they got to that. It's it's actually a really interesting read. Um, throw it into to chat GPT if you want a summary of it. But um, it, it's actually uh, not a bedtime read. It's it's a it's a day read. Uh, it won't put you to sleep. Uh, and so you know, with with that being said, I I think um, you know, please continue to educate yourself. Um, use us uh, beyond hello uh, as as a resource. Uh, all these wonderful folks in in the state continuing um, to to push this thing forward, and um, you know look forward to to continuing to to progress um, what will end up being on the right side of of cannabis in uh, in the Commonwealth, and looking to looking forward to bringing economic development and careers uh, not only to Arlington but but Northern Virginia as well. So. Uh, thanks for your time and, and look forward to, to any questions. Thank you, Trent, and thank you all for your remarks. Um, we do have a few questions. Trent, you had already said that Colorado was an example of a state that has legalized cannabis and then met target for taxes raised. Um, does anyone know what the total number VA expects to raise from legalization? What? Yeah. Oh, go, go ahead. Go, go ahead, go ahead Trent. Um, so that 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 really depends. Um, I think the the compromise bill was at like eleven and three quarters ish, um, is where it, where it, where it landed. I'll just call it twelve uh, for for easy math sake. Uh, JLARC came out with like a four billion dollar market. I think Senator Evan uh, mentioned the two point four billion dollar uh, illicit market. I'm just going to call it like a three billion dollar market. Now that doesn't just happen overnight. Um, we have to have supply, uh, pricing dynamics, small businesses getting stood up. Um, that includes myself. I'm a, we're we're a small business, um, and and so um, these these facilities take real time to build. Uh, plants just don't appear overnight. It's an agricultural crop, and so kind of over like a, a two year period, I think you'd see at at twelve percent, um, you know, somewhere between. Like two hundred and fifty and three hundred and fifty million dollars of of a, of of tax revenue raised um, a, as you work towards kind of um, supply and demand constraints uh, that that would just occur naturally uh, out of the gate, and then kind of at that twelve percent, um, you can kind of back into the math based on you know a two and a half to four billion dollar market um, that I think is very realistic uh, for the Commonwealth. Does anyone else have anything to add? Okay, so but I'm going to combine. Oh, John, were you going to? 
I was just going to say that, you know, we by year three in our estimates this year came out with slightly no lower numbers than, than Trent was spotting on 185 million a year. Um, but that's not to counteract a lot of the other points he made about it. You know, it will take time for the market to, to ramp up and it depends on um, ultimate, you know, market demand. Uh, we are basing our numbers um, on numbers that are higher than the JLARC estimates. We think the, the JLARC estimates from 2020 um, probably don't reflect the changing conditions over the last four years in, in market demand here. Thank you. I'm going to combine Linda Scott and Jerry Laporte questions. Um, basically, what was the rationale for the governor's veto and what happens if the legislature overrides the governor's veto of the cannabis legislation? I, I'll leave with that if that's okay. Um, I'm not going to try and rationalize the governor's statement. The governor has been um, antagonistic to this um, now um, legal to possess plant in Virginia uh, throughout you know, his remarks on cannabis. But if we were to override his veto, the, the bill, Aaron's bill, would go into effect and become law and we would have a regulated market. Uh, I don't think anyone anticipates that his bill, that, that we would override his veto because the, the bill passed by a fairly slim margin in both bodies to start with. It would need to actually attract support from the governor's party, and we don't anticipate that happening. Um, so we have we have to uh, get in a mode where we start over in a future year. Excellent. Okay, um, another question. A large recent study published in Psychological Medicine found that cannabis use can lead to psychosis and schizophrenia, and particularly that up to 30% of schizophrenia cases could be prevented absent cannabis use. While legalization will increase our tax base, how do we think the the what do we think about the downside health effects on our citizens and the possibility that easier access from legalization may broaden use and the resulting potential health issues? Well, thank you for that question. I think it was from an anonymous user. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you for that question. You know, I, I think when I think about the downside effects when it, it comes to a untested, unregulated market has more disastrous effects, you know, such as death. Um, and I think that weighs very, very heavily um, on our minds as well. But obviously, I, I think, you know, when you're trying to set up a market like this, you do so uh, making sure you can put every uh, piece of regulatory framework in place so that it doesn't have a, a devastating effect. This is why in the bill, it makes sure that before products even come out, that our health um, services board um, takes a look at um, uh, the potency of the, uh, of these plants and making sure that it's safe to go out before consumption here. Um, and I think, um, yeah, and I think, you know, again, we only can go so far, uh, but I think the, the, the flip side of that coin is not having a regulated uh, market where there are just untested uh, products that are out there and unregulated products out there with um, potentially exposing potential users to all kinds of chemicals that can lead to death. And in some cases, we've seen that. I would just add to, you know, I don't know about the specific study, but the studies that I've seen, these ties are particularly associated with higher THC concentrations in products, and um, sometimes even more associated with younger users. Um, and I think one of the uh, abilities of a regulated market, and this goes to part of what Senator Rouse was saying, is they are tested and the consumers or patients have um, the ability to have the information about what concentration of product they're taking. It's not like, you know, you go to a store, you don't know whether you're getting a low alcohol beer or, you know, high proof vodka, you know what you're getting. So you can then titrate your dose better. And we would also work with, um, you know, the public and the regulated industry to work on education about, you know, if you're taking a really high concentrated THC product, it's a really tiny dose and it might be smaller than you think, but that's, that's education that can be done. So what about the gummies, um, the gas station, THC, those derivatives? Um, oftentimes, I think sometimes they're marketed towards youth with, with the colorful packaging. Um, any thoughts about that? Yeah, yeah I, I don't think anyone here is advocating for unregulated, untested, unknown 
products being used by people, particularly by minors. We have had legislation dealing with packaging and marketing of those products. But what we want to do is we want to say this is an adult substance for adults who want to make a choice for their uh, personal use or for medical, um, in the case of what's already legal for medical purposes. Um, but we don't, that's, that's the result of what happens with an unregulated market. And um, others could speak further to it, but I, th I think what we're calling for is a very uh, defined product that people know what they're getting and that they're getting what they intend to get and that they're adults making a decision rather than uh, people, uh, particularly anyone who's younger, um, ending up with something by mistake. Yeah, I, th I think that's an important piece. Um, you know, unfortunately, this is a, a loophole um, that was taken advantage of uh, from the 2018 Farm Bill, which was passed at the federal level. Um, there was a, um, you know, rush to get into CBD 2018 through 2020. Uh, that didn't work out for many of these companies. And so therefore, you know, in trying to save their investment, uh, they went down the path of of creating synthetic uh, derived can uh, cannabis, strictly, you know, THC compound, uh, from other cannabinoids um, and, and, and have been selling it through traditional retail channels. Those traditional retail channels, you know, don't verify testing. They don't verify where it came from. Um, you know, I think the governor two sessions ago actually tried to put some guardrails around this. Um, it all comes down to enforcement. However, uh, if an adult does not uh, have a outlet to legally procure cannabis, um, they're, they're going to turn to these routes. Um, and these people are just going to keep selling because there's, there's customers, there's demand there. And unfortunately, um, again, they don't really care who they sell to from an age gate perspective. So, um, it, it's, it's a little bit of a mess from a federal level. Unfortunately, there needs clarity around that. Um, but more, most importantly, um, it, it puts law enforcement uh, in a bind because they they can't tell uh, who or what or where it came from. Uh, if you had a regulated market to combat that, um, that would be much, much, much easier. Uh, and so it, it's it's unfortunately turned into a little bit of the Wild West uh, in the common Commonwealth when it comes to, you know, Delta 8, Delta 10, Delta X, Delta 0, Delta 9, THCA flower, um, all the derivatives that people will just make up uh, to to skirt regulation. Absolutely. Um, John Bystat asks that or says he appreciates the balance in multifaceted presentations and asks how does the regulatory scheme in Virginia compare to our bordering states, especially Maryland and the district? Are there best practices that the Commonwealth is or should emulate? Sure, I think that was one of the things where you know we tried to model our social equity piece um, from uh, our neighbor state Maryland um, as well. Uh, and looking around the the nation, just taking you know what we've learned from looking at Colorado. Obviously, there was a lot of lessons learned from looking at New York and trying to make sure Virginia gets it right. And when you look at this bill here, especially look at the tax rate, uh, we understood that we couldn't have a tax rate so high that it would actually do more harm than good. It, it, it continue to let users grow across the state to perhaps purchase uh, marijuana. Uh, and then there's all kinds of issues there with enforcement. And so we had to get the tax rate right while also learning from, again, other uh, states uh, what went well for them, uh, but also what have come to some of the mistakes that they've made, we've learned from. And that's what you, you have here in SB 448. And that's why we found, you know, we're, we're really very um, curious and to say, you know, why would the governor veto this bill when you know, there was tons of work that went into SB 448. And if you look on our LIS system, what you will see is the different <laughs> versions. I think it was maybe 15 or 12 different versions um, and all sorts of amendments to this bill, because this was, again, a framework where all the stakeholders got together and came up with this great compromise. And so 
Um, I really appreciate that that question, but this is our, our best practice and our best shot at making sure we can stand up a, a regulated and taxed market when it comes to cannabis in Virginia. Thank you. Um, you know, maybe, the, um, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I just want to suggest that maybe um, Sean would describe within the Cannabis Control Authority, there's different boards and um, uh, subdivisions. The Cannabis Control Authority is the regulatory authority that the General Assembly set up to regulate cannabis overall. And, and, and we moved our medical program from the Board of Pharmacy there. But there is a, um, a health advisory board, and there's also a board on um, community reinvestment about mm -hmm. part of the profits anticipated or anticipated tax revenue, I should say, being invested. But we have um, a few different groups within uh, to, you know, within our regulation. Sure. Yeah. The, the CCA, the agency or authority was created and is governed by a five member board of directors. But there is a public health advisory council with a more diverse membership. I think it's uh, 22 members under current law, but might be off by one or two. Um, those are those that body meets at least twice a year. Um, and, you know, if adult use rolls out, they have responsibilities towards um, you know, reviewing regulations that the CCA will promulgate re related to adult use. But um, until that time, we've been having them hear presentations about the medical program or other um, public health concerns related to cannabis. There's been a lot of interest from them, for example, in um, these hemp derived products that you were mentioning earlier that really appeal to, to children in common stores. And then the equity reinvestment fund and that board hasn't really met since I've been at the CCA in over the last two years. I think they tried once, but uh, didn't quite reach a quorum. So not as much activity there at this time. Can you talk more about what the purpose of the equity reinvestment committee is? Yeah, so well, um, I'll, I'll let you go, Senator. No, no, I want to, Sean can probably say it better than I, but I'll just say in the original bill, what we did is we allocated the uh, tax revenue from cannabis into different places. Some of it was geared towards um, uh, pre-K programs for disadvantaged children. Some of it was geared to, geared to mental health. And a substantial percentage, I believe almost 40%, was um, the equity reinvestment fund, which the idea was that some of the uh, tax revenue derived from the sale of cannabis would be reinvested in communities that had been disadvantaged by the um, by the war on cannabis, uh, and it could also go to things like reentry, things to or job training, things to make communities uh, prosper better and 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 uh, make up for that uh, damage. But maybe uh, maybe Sean would like to add to that. No, I, I think that was uh, an excellent summary of of the intent of it, and I think it's been um, you know that role has been massaged a little bit in different legislation um, over the intervening years, but generally the same concept of, you know, a group that looks at that money that's taken in that pot that's meant to be reinvested and, and determines, you know, either the best places it can go or the best uses for it to serve its purpose. And, and following up on that, you know, you'd mentioned the war on, um, or the, the cannabis war, Senator Eben, have, what efforts have been made to encourage or support African-American business owners, particularly to get into the cannabis business? Well, you know, there's been some federal court decisions about giving racial preferences that have um, resulted in some other state's equity provisions going to court. So what we've tried to do, I, I've got a, a note here on some of them. We were, we were doing things like... Um, in, in Senator Rouse's final bill, I believe it was giving criteria for micro business uh, license applicants who had at least 66% ownership and direct control, who either had perhaps had a, a conviction on a misdemeanor marijuana uh, related violation, or are the parent, child, sibling, or spouse of someone who's been impacted by that kind of violation, or had been resided in a historically economically disadvantaged community in three of the past five years, or um, been uh, received either like a federal Pell Grant or spent two years at a institution that had a, a significantly um, 
a significant percentage of people with Pell Grants or been an honorably discharged veterans. So I don't think that we had explicit racial um, preferences in the bill, but the idea was that we would still help people who had been uh, impacted uh, by either economic uh, concerns or perhaps by the war on cannabis. Thank you. As a, and as a corollary to that, in the bill, um, it also directed the CCA to establish a position for, um, I think the title change over time, but a liaison for these types of applicants and also a whole team to support that. And so, you know, we would envision that if, if similar language ever became law, that it would be, um, you know, a task that the CCA would take on to really reach out into as many communities as possible that fit, uh, you know, those targeted um, areas within uh, whatever legislation comes through. Yeah, and just to build on that one really quick is, um, you know, that liaison was was going to help interface with the, the current operators because uh, running a cannabis is is not, you know, rainbows and cotton candies and unicorns. Uh, it's super difficult. It's a privileged license with uh, with a lot of oversight and a lot of regulations. And so um, setting up almost like an incubation uh, program with current operators in the state, um, what was going to be part of that as well, which I think was a, a super unique idea uh, and a really exciting idea for, for us um, as current operators to be able to share the knowledge uh, base that that we've created, um, you know, over over the last you know uh, eight plus years, um, and so uh, I think that was a really cool and unique novel concept that that Senator Evans, Senator Rouse, and and, and Delegate Krizak all, all did with you know the support of CCA it would have been rolled out and and really cool to to see happen. Absolutely. So it doesn't look like we have any. Wait, wait, we might have one more question. Okay, this is a great question to end on. What's the, Linda Scott asks, what's the outlook for what happens in the next three to five years? Where will we be in 2027? So um, I, think, I think that's a great question. I, I think uh, understandably where we are with this governor, I don't think we uh, we get an actual, and again, I am very direct and, and I sometimes folks on <laughs> I uh, like to hear the harsh truth, but it's the harsh truth. I think um, it is a really big mountain to climb with this governor and his administration. I think he will veto um, setting up a can an adult uh, cannabis market, regardless of what we send him. Um, I think the outlook is that we have to do our, our work to ensure we have a Democrat majority um, in, the, in, the, in the governorship, um, as well as the House and the Senate, so we can actually uh, get this done. Um, and so understanding that, you know, the, the, we're here for another four years. The governor is uh, is only here for a year, um, but we still have more work to do to get this right. And I think, again, this is a great starting point for us. I think uh, it's a really strong bill, a really strong measurement. Um, but ultimately, I think we'll, we'll just have to wait our time until we get a more friendlier uh, person in the, the governor's mansion that uh, will take this They'll be uh, act kindly in our favor, I'll say. And and uh, yeah, I think the the year in the question was twenty twenty seven. So I'm I'm going to say the glass is half full, <laughs> and that by twenty twenty seven there'll be a new governor in Virginia, uh, so that it's possible that after the twenty twenty five uh, gubernatorial election, that someone will take office in January of twenty twenty six who would sign an adult use marketplace bill. So that means that whether it's in 2027 or or thereabouts, that we could expect to see a more regulated market uh, for non-medical use for adult use in Virginia. So I, I think I think there's a recognition, uh, even among the other side of the aisle, that this is what's coming with the lack of their effort to try and repeal the uh, progress that we've already made. Um, so. So I'm 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 hopeful that the glass is half full and that we'll be able to have finally have um, uh, fruition to our efforts in full. Excellent. Well, thank you all for joining us. This has been an excellent conversation. Um, I know several of you left your contact information, and we'll definitely share that. So thank you again, and have a great evening. Thanks for Thanks having for us. Having Thanks for having us. Have a good evening.